Welcome to this year's Danube Salon, a new compass. Which direction will Europe's security take? My name is Sebastian Schaeffer. I'm the director of the Institute for the Danube region in Central Europe in Vienna, and I have the pleasure to moderate the Danube Salon again. I would like to welcome, first of all, Martin Eichtinger, president of the Europa Forum Wachau. Caroline H. Stadler, Federal Minister for the EU and Constitution of the Federal Chancellery of Austria. <laughs> Peter Berg, Minister of State for European Affairs and Defense of the Republic of Ireland. <laughs> Tutti Tupurainen, Member of the Finnish Parliament and former Minister of European Affairs. <laughs> Lukas Mandel, member of the European Parliament. <laughs> My other panel guests, Elizabeth Bro and Alena Kutzko. <laughs> and last but not least, Colin Schikluna and Ambassador Harald Stranzler. I would also like to welcome the members of the regional governments from the Danube Basin. I would also like to welcome all excellencies of embassies. Please forgive me if I do not mention all of you um, separately because we have a lot of them and we are very proud and we want to use the time to discuss. Um, and of course, everybody in the audience, and I would also like to welcome the rector of the University for Continuing Education and the chairman of the IDM, Friedrich Faulhammer. This venue is very special. We are not at Campus Krems, where we have been the last two years, but on the MS Dürnstein. And you may wonder, yes, this is a nice venue, but why is he emphasizing this? When the sky is clear and the visibility is good, navigating a boat comes easy. But it changes when the weather breaks, like we experienced today, and uh, we lose the sense of direction. Without a compass, we are not able to continue the journey. The same is true in uncertain times like those that we are living in now. With the pandemic barely over, the unprovoked and unjustified full-scale invasion of Ukraine by the regime in Moscow has brought back once again unspeakable cruelty to the European continent. With record high inflation, climate challenges, and I could go on and on, we often lose a sense of direction. We are confronted with a variety of opinions and it becomes harder and harder to differentiate between fact and fiction. We become atomized and less united. Guidance is needed and if our sight becomes foggy, we need a compass to find our way, not only when sailing a ship. The EU has created the strategic compass to agree on a common strategic vision for the EU's role in security and defense and to commit to a set of concrete and wide-ranging objectives to achieve these goals in the coming five to ten years. But let me leave it for now and ask Ambassador Martin Eichtinger, Special Envoy and Coordinator for Neighborhood Policy and the Foreign Policy Dimension of the Danube Region, as well as the President of the Europa Forum Wachau, for his opening remarks. Please. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Yes, good afternoon, Madam Minister Edstadler, Madam former Minister Tuporainen, and now Chairwoman of the Foreign Affairs Committee in the Finnish Parliament, um, uh, Mr. Peter Berg, uh, State Secretary for European and Defense Affairs, Colin Schikluna, Lukas Mandel, Member of the Euro European Parliament, Ambassador Stranzl. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, it's a Great pleasure to welcome you at what I would say is a very innovative approach of uh, the Euro Europa Forum Wachau. It's the first time that we do a panel session on a Danube ship and I'm very uh, delighted to say that this has been in cooperation with the Danube Shipping Company and I'm very thankful for this cooperation. Um, I wanted to start my remarks by saying that this is the closest you can get to our Danube River without becoming wet. Given the rain, this maybe is no longer really true. But uh, it's uh, wonderful that we can, at the same time, while we will be discussing very serious issues, 
Uh, we can at the same time look at what is a marvel of lower Austrian landscape and also a UNESCO cultural world heritage, uh, the Wachau Valley. So please, uh, now and then also look out of the window and enjoy the landscape. Uh, we, it's the third time that we do this panel in cooperation with the Institute of the Danube and uh, Central Europe, IDM, and with the working group of the Danube regions, the AG Donauländer. And three years ago, we celebrated at this occasion, on this occasion, 10 years of the European Union strategy of the Danube region. Very important for us in Austria and even more important for Lower Austria. About 30 years ago, Lower Austria and at the time Baden-Württemberg decided to start on a wonderful uh, venture, which is to connect the regions along the Danube. And it was even more important because after the fall of the Iron Curtain, the regions along the Danube moved closer together. It's a very lively and a very active cooperation, very much supported by many, many institutions, among others, the IDM. So three years ago, we celebrated 10 years uh, of the European Union strategy of the Danube region. And last year, of course, we already for the first time had to look to this very dreadful situation in Ukraine, to the war of aggression of Russia in the Ukraine, and uh, what it meant for, for Europe and all the suffering. And so last year, we were already very much under this impression of the war in Europe. And this year, we want to look to the future. We want to say a new compass. In what direction does the European security go? And as you know, in all of the countries of uh, Europe, the, uh, the war in Ukraine has really launched a new debate on the, uh, on the question of security in Europe. So at the same time also in Austria. And uh, it's wonderful that we have, uh, of course, representatives of the Irish and the, and the Finnish uh, government and parliament, because uh, this is for us as Austrians very important. We look to you. Uh, we were very stunned by the fact that Finland has so quickly moved to this huge majority in favor of a NATO membership. Uh, we've seen a similar development in Sweden, and uh, um, of course, uh, they uh, have not yet made it to the last step, but uh, uh, we have, uh, of course, monitored this very closely, and I think it's a very important uh, new factor in the European security landscape. So once again, welcome on board ship. Um, I will have uh, asked then uh, at the end also Ambassador Stranzel, my colleague in the Austrian Foreign Ministry, who is the national coordinator for the European Union strategy for the Danube region. And in my new position, I'm very happy that we join as a team on this very important Austrian chairmanship, which we will take over on the 1st of November. For 14 months, Austria will be in the chair of the European Union strategy for the Danube region. We have lots of great ideas, um, maybe more ideas than we can eventually handle, but uh, we are very much looking to this important chairmanship. As I said also, for Lower Austria, the Danube as a river is a very, very important factor in all our foreign policy considerations. Enjoy the debate. I'm delighted that so many are joining in for this, for this afternoon session. And once again, welcome to all our international visitors. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ambassador Eichtinger. I've prepared um, a bridge to the next panel, but you have done that perfectly. And in order to save time, I would ask um, all three panelists uh, to the stage, Caroline Edstadler, um, Peter Berg and uh, Tutti Tupin. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So we have we have talked about. Um, that since the 24th of February, um, the, what was coined as Zeitenwende happened and that uh, made dramatic changes also for the security architecture in Europe. And um, we have also heard that we um, have seen that former neutral countries are actually uh, willing to join uh, NATO. I would uh, like to uh, start in this case with um, Minister Edstadler and uh, ask um, 
as a militarily but not politically neutral country. Austria often takes a different approach to defense and security and uh, concentrates on humanitarian aid and medical support. Is this a situation that is going to change? In practical terms, what contribution will or can Austria make to the security and defense architecture in the framework of that security compass that gives also the title of this uh, discussion? Well, good afternoon from my side also. First of all, I would like to congratulate the president of the Europa Forum Wachau and also the managing director for organizing this wonderful ship trip with a really high standing discussion with uh, one minister and a uh, former minister. And by the way, Titi will always be a minister in my view because we were together for more than three years in the General Affairs Council and we, we went through so many things and crises and debates and if I'm thinking of 2020 discussing the conference on the future of Europe then well um, yeah there are so many memories in my in my heart and my my head so I'm really happy that you came and, and also you Peter. Um, regarding the security and defense policy I would say the 24th of February changed last year changed everything for Europe but also for the member states and I can only reiterate what I'm saying always, Austria has a really strong stance on how we reacted on the war of aggression of Russia towards Ukraine. We are not neutral in the political sense. We are really supporting Ukraine politically in humanitarian and financial aid. Uh, and we cannot support Ukraine militarily-wise. But we have the wonderful Irish clause. And we are abstaining uh, constructively when it comes to um, lethal aid, lethal weapon aid uh, for Ukraine. And I think uh, this is also something, and I brought it and I had the time to read it uh, during my trip from Innsbruck to uh, Wachau today. There is the annual progress report on the strategic compass. And it says everything. The discussions on the strategic compass uh, started long before the war of aggression started. But we concluded it already in March 2022. And if we are working together, like uh, it is written down, we act in West Secure and partner together, and we are doing that, we are contributing to all these four strengths, then we can really achieve a lot and we can be militarily wise, much stronger. And by the way, Austria also uh, increased the budget for military a lot, which was necessary, I would say, but it happened only after this uh, big threat from outside came. Thank you so much. Um, Former minister, uh, but still for for for, for Caroline, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> will always remain your minister, dear friend. <laughs> um, nevertheless, I mean, uh, a few days don't don't change uh, anything. I would say in this case, because um, one of the Kremlin's alleged excuses and arguments behind the invasion of Ukraine, the full-scale invasion that is, was hindering NATO's expansion to Russian borders, and as a result of the war, exactly the opposite happened because uh, Finland, Russia's immediate and until recently neutral neighbor, joined NATO. Um, it's, it's over 3,000 kilometers of, of NATO borders now. And um, this year uh, there is even a, a border wall that's being constructed to boost its security against the Russian Federation. Do these uh, steps increase a sense of uh, security among the Finnish society or is there a fear that Russia might feel provoked uh, by them? Well, first of all, it's good to be on the boat, which is on the move, because it describes very well the situation where we are, the security structures of, of Europe and the whole world. They are on the move, and the direction is what, uh, not what Vladimir Putin was expecting. He wanted to stop NATO from enlarging. He wanted to have a fragmented and weak West, but on the contrary, he got a united front in the Western world and also elsewhere in the world, and a NATO enlargement has happened. Finland is already a member in NATO, and we expect Sweden to be adopted also very soon, hopefully before the, the Vilnius summit. So that, that is a tectonic change, and Finns made it because of two reasons. Number one is our security reasons. It was first and foremost a security uh, choice for us. We needed more security to our country, which, which is in the very close neighborhood to Russia. We have 1,340 kilometers of border to Russia. And our previous uh, defense doctrine uh, became just old-fashioned. It, it was based on the idea 
that our own strong military capabilities would deter the aggressors, aggressor because of the high price of losing lives and casualties. But Putin's Russia has shown that it, it counts no price in human life. So we needed something else to deter Russia and NATO and its Article 5. It is the ultimate security guarantee. So yes, it was about security and we are more uh, secure in NATO and there's a huge unanimity in Finland in favor of NATO. I would even say there's an enthusiasm about NATO in Finland and I always remind them that EU is also relevant when it comes to security. But the second reason that we joined is it's a question of, of actually morality. We find it immoral to stay neutral and non-aligned in a situation where Ukraine is fighting for their lives, for our values, our freedom, our democracy, our way of life. And these values, they are enshrined in the European Union treaties and Ukrainians are fighting for them every day on the battlefield. So there was a very strong moral sentiment in the Finnish society that you cannot stay neutral in this situation, you have to pick the side, and we want to be on the side of the Ukrainians, and we want to defend our basic values. There's no middle ground in this war of values, and that, is, that was also clear for Finns. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much for these very uh, clear, clear words. Um, Minister Berg, Ireland remains geographically distant from, from uh, the Russian Federation and also the war that uh, was brought by this country on Ukraine. Like Austria, it's militarily neutral. Nevertheless, the war has sparked a debate about dropping also the long-established uh, neutrality. What do you think would come next? Is, is Ireland more prone to follow the footsteps of Finland or to remain uh, neutral like Austria and why? Well, we're having a huge discussion in Ireland at the moment about our security, but I do think there is no doubt in the fact that we won't be joining NATO and that we will remain neutral uh, as a country. But I think it was about 60 years ago next Thursday when President John F. Kennedy was addressing our Oireachtas, a joint sitting of our Oireachtas in Dublin, and he said at that juncture that Ireland was never neutral when it came to liberty or tyranny. And that really underscores the point that we're a country who is not politically neutral. We always have had a very strong and solid voice in calling out tyranny right across the globe. And I think if you look back at diplomatic relations in Ireland, its voice definitely has carried a premium because it's a neutral country. When you go into conflict zones and you're trying to find a solution, put forward genuine pathways to try and get peace in areas, when you are neutral, I think that comes as a premium. Also, we're very aware, though, on the other hand, that there are huge threats that are facing our country, that are facing our community. We do know there are so many threats in terms of the varying different nature and diverse threats like our cyber security, hybrid threats. We had a huge attack during the pandemic on our health service executive where ransomware was sent into the records of our public health service and so many patient data files were compromised. And that really opened our eyes to the huge diverse challenges now that we have to face as a community. That's why we're a founding member of PESCO. That's why we're really keen to collaborate with many missions. We joined the Center of Excellence for Cybersecurity and Talent, which is NATO accredited. And we see our pathway in participating in missions and simulations for cybersecurity that can enhance our capacity and capability into the future. And we really want to focus on that. Also, we're very clear in terms of the public infrastructure that we're going to have off our shores. We have huge data cables in the Atlantic on our exclusive economic zone, whereby there was a huge amount of Russian patrols in recent times. We're also investing heavily in offshore wind. We're going to have significant infrastructure attached to that offshore. So we as a country want to really get into gear our capacity uh, to defend those assets. And that's why we're having this forum now to seek a holistic approach and how we are going to go forward in protecting our country and to work with our neighbors. That's very, very important. But our citizens will be very firmly of the belief that we should hold on to our neutrality, and that's firmly where there will be at this juncture. Thank you. Uh, Minister Ishadla, are we heading into the direct, right direction with the strategic compass? Uh, Minister Burke men uh, mentioned the, the permanent structured cooperation also as, a, as an alternative, maybe, security uh, approach within uh, the, the European continent. What else would Austria advocate for regarding European peace and 
security architecture that has been uh, shattered? What would be the Austrian proposal for a more resilient European security architecture? To be very clear, I think it's exactly the right direction where we're heading uh, with this uh, strategic compass because there's a lot in this uh, strategic compass which we should have done maybe already earlier, to be very honest. But at least uh, now we are doing these things. And um, to, do you remember when we started the discussions uh, in the General Affairs Council to the Conference on the Future of Europe? And I was always a strong advocate for not excluding treaty changes. And there was a huge discussion going on uh, in, uh, among many countries because they were afraid discussing the treaty changes. And then in the end, we got a lot of suggestions uh, by the civil, uh, civilians also, which don't make it necessary to change the treaties, but to make it necessary to coordinate our work and to strengthen our forces. And I would go so far that I would say we ha would have never have this strategic compass without the war in Ukraine. Because it was so clear from one moment to the other that we have to strengthen our forces, that no one can get out of his or, or her dress and, or trousers and, and that, we, that we can deal with some, um, some challenges only together. And that's what I say. I, I hear Peter saying that there is a huge discussion going on in Austria. I think this discussion is also ongoing uh, in, in Austria, especially regarding the new architecture for security and defense. And it's also necessary to set up or to newly set it up because the, the, the things changed completely and I mentioned already the budget, but also to make it clear where we as Austrians, even if we are neutral, contributing. We are there, we are in the battle groups, we are, we are there when the, the new missions are sent by the European Union. So it's not the, the, the way some might think, we are neutral and we are not uh, making our hands uh, dirty. So um, we have to do it and we have also to stay clear on the side of Ukraine and to f defend our values. This is the way Europe wants to live. We want to live in freedom, we want to live in, in solidarity also, but we want to live peacefully. Yeah. And this changed tremendously in February last year and, and this is why I think this is the right direction and if we are really can do everything which is written down from the framework, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. then we are wise and then we can fight back Putin. And we can really show that the European Union, and he feels it already, is more united than ever before. Thank you. Well, if, if we look from the perspective of Helsinki, and uh, the EU is, is moving towards the strategic compass, but Finland move, moved towards NATO, as we said. Eh? Is, I mean, it's, it's not mutually exclusive, but um, would you say that it's uh, a sustainable way that the EU is doing with regards to its security architecture? It is absolutely necessary that the EU develops a security provider and makes the strategic compass something tangible. Mm -hmm. It is absolutely necessary and it's worth acknowledging that actually now that they are hopefully soon with Sweden, two new EU member states that are also members in NATO, that these organizations come closer to each other. And at some point we need to discuss the question of division of labor. These two institutions, organs, they have to be complementing each other, but we have to make sure that Putin cannot divide and rule. EU and NATO must uh, sing the same song, so to speak, and I'm happy that, that our institutions uh, discussions, our strategic uh, compass and NATO strategic concept, uh, they, they uh, aim at same, same direction and, and same, same goal. But for Finland, we still think that the EU is most relevant. And I'm happy that my, my colleagues from Austria and, and I, uh, Ireland are speaking in favor of a stronger EU, because NATO is a military alliance. And look what the EU has done for Ukraine. When we talk about lethal assistance, we actually talk about EU. Mm -hmm. EU has proved to be a very relevant and strong player when it comes to assisting Ukraine. And we need to continue that and make it even more significant. And for us, the Article 42.7, which is the Solidarity Clause, Mutual Assistance Clause in the EU, still is relevant. And we want to make that also something, something concrete. But we have different roles, NATO, 
and EU, and it's important to pay attention to the most urgent needs in both institutions. NATO has to strengthen its eastern flank and make sure that it has all the military capabilities to make the mutual defense something really concrete that Putin understands, and EU, the number one priority is to invest in defense industries and our capabilities so that we can really coordinate our uh, structures and have the necessary equipment. Now we are assisting Ukraine, it's urgent, but we also have to make sure that there is enough uh, assets in our storages uh, for our own security and EU can do that, coordinate our defense industries. Thank you so much. From, from Dublin's perspective, how can the security campus enhance the defense architecture of the EU be assessed? And uh, in what areas will Ireland be particularly involved? Well, I think it will provide a holistic approach. I think we really need an organ like the Strategic Compass to bring together the defense policy of the European Union, but also to reflect a modern world. We are living in an age now that there are so many different type of threats. As I said, the uh, options aren't a binary solution anymore. There are so many hybrid threats, cybersecurity, uh, threats that through disinformation that we had never imagined uh, even a decade ago. And that's why we need a policy that's going to reflect and respond to those challenges. And Ireland will be to the very forefront of assisting, especially in cybersecurity, because of our recent experience in, term, in terms of the attack that I referenced, um, but also in civilian crisis management. That's another aspect of it which I think is very, very important. And working through rule of law as well, all those aspects are going to be critical to the strategic compass. And we really will be to the forefront in working and ensuring as well that, which is very important, that our, our sovereign identity is protected in terms of the citizens' priorities in Ireland, in terms of constructive abstention when you're going through uh, issues like Ukraine, which is very important. And I'm always reminded by my minister colleague, Caroline, when we had a bilateral earlier on this year, and she was really articulating in terms of what on the ground it means to be neutral and providing an approach that supports Ukrainian citizens, like providing uniforms to the first responders at the scene through the firefighters. And citizens can really see the assistance that provides. And we as a country providing spare parts for the grid in Ukraine, where you know, we see how much Putin has tackled and really bombed public infrastructure, which is a huge attack on human rights on the very core of a citizen. Also spare parts for their water infrastructure, and all those key you know, supports that citizens need at that time, they are also so important and sometimes are forgotten in warfare. And that's why it's important neutral countries can provide that track uh, through non-lethal uh, aid, which is going to be critically important to our country into the future as well. Thank you. Um, Minister Edstadler, you already mentioned that maybe it could have been adopted earlier, such a strategic compass. If we look back, would it, would, it, would it have been, for instance, after the annexation of Crimea, I think that the European Union should have started? And not to too much dwell in the past, um, what would be, looking to the future, the lessons uh, that we might even have to uh, take from, from that development? And what would be the next necessary steps, um, also from the side of Austria? Well, first of all, I, I was a criminal judge in my former life be before I became a politician. And I know if you look to things uh, from now, then things are always different. And of course, when we're looking to the past, uh, from nowadays, I would say we should have reacted clear after the annexion of the Crimea. But we did not. And at that time, uh, I was uh, working at the European Court of Human Rights and I was sometimes going to the ministerial committees and listening to the ambassadors there discussing things and there wasn't really a reaction and not an intervention by other states. Ukraine and Russian ambassador were discussing with each other if it was legal or not, um, but the others did not interfere. And everything, everyone was happy to go out and to say, okay, we had a d discussion now on that, but no one dared to touch the topic really. So. Yes, we should have reacted in another way. For the future, I would say, um, it would be good if we could absorb the problems of the future earlier. And I would say we have the capacity to do so. 
But the last three years, were only, we were only struggling with challenges. We had so many challenges to fight back that we had no, not the room to think what could come also um, the way. And so I, th I really do hope that things are calming down now and that we can do so. I just wanted to add something because Peter reminded me um, um, of this occasion when I was with eight female delegations in Kiev uh, last uh, November when we had to go to the shelter because there was an air raid um, and we were brought to a site where a missile um, yeah, uh, murdered three people and that they were fighting against the fire. And that's what Peter mentioned and he, he reminded me today already uh, during our bilateral. We were standing there, we were all shocked. I've never seen pictures like that live in my life before. I'm a child of peace, so as the most of, of you sitting here. And uh, then we saw that the f one of the firefighter he wore a uh, uniform and at the back was Berufsfeuerwehr Graz. Berufsfeuerwehr Graz. Everyone from Austria knows what that means. Our humanitarian aid, our, our aid for Ukraine is really needed there. And the second thing I wanted to add is that I think in Austria, even if we are not discussing uh, neutrality or the NATO, I think it would be too easy to boil down uh, the discussion to NATO yes, no, or neutrality yes, no, because we have a lot of room in between to act, and this is what, it, what is necessary. And I thought very often of Tutti, and we discussed it also, I think it's also a question of where you stand, geographically. For, for example, Finland has a long border with Russia. That this is something, this is, this is making something with the people, I guess, on the ground. And it reminds me also to my time, and this is the last thing I, I, I would like to mention, uh, when I was working at the European Court of Human Rights at that time, um, we had uh, 47 members of uh, the Council of Europe, and I discussed very often with seven friends from seven nations things. And among them, there was an Azerbaijan guy. And I told him, I said, Ilkin, why aren't you releasing the guy from uh, the jail? You have three or four judgments in the meantime, and you should really follow the court's uh, judgment. And he said to me, Caroline, it's very easy to grant human rights if you are surrounded by friendly neighborhood, but it's not so easy if you have Iran and Turkey as a neighbor. And this is what I learned at the European Council. You should never judge someone in whose shoes you didn't walk. And this is not for us a way that we say, okay, we keep neutral and we are do doing nothing. And that's what I want to say. We are doing a lot. And I think we don't have to hide away because we um, did a lot of, of money support also for Ukraine. And we are working actively in all these uh, areas of the strategic compass. And all our Minister for Defense is in a good contact uh, with all the other European Union uh, members, uh, member states. And I think this is the way we should do it in the future. Think of the future, think what could come and absorb the problems. Thank you very much. Um, if, if we also take up what, what has been mentioned about uh, the cyber attacks, that was also something that Finland experienced after they joined NATO. A lot of organizations became increasingly targeted. Um, if, if we look into the future of the challenges that are going to arise, because I mean, now under the protection of Article 5, I think. There, there will be um, at least no direct confrontation in the foreseeable future, but maybe it is hybrid uh, threats will be something that we uh, will be see, will be seen. And uh, do you think that also within the strategic compass there is enough uh, room to help you fighting back? That we will have to evaluate all the time because our capabilities when it comes to countering hybrid and cyber attacks, they have to be in place. They have to be up and running because Russia won't stop. It will continue trying to destabilize, uh, imposing all kind of uh, unbelievable missions uh, and then saying it's doing nothing. <laughs> it's only accidents. Uh, luckily, we didn't uh, experience uh, anything too bad uh, after we joined NATO and even in the period of the so-called gray zone when we had left the application and were not yet members, uh, actually the reaction from Moscow was quite calm and uh, something that we could anticipate. But we had to be prepared for war, war, worse. And I think the hybrid toolbox that we have in the strategic compass, it's great. And we have to invest in that. And it's good that we have rehearsals uh, we are training our officials for possible uh, cyber attacks as well. So now our officials are frequently 
having training and sort of, you know, practice on the field, uh, a simul simul simulation yeah. of an actual attack. So we can be better prepared. So crisis prepared and preparedness in, in all scenario is something that we should need to increase for all kind of scenario. But let me conclude for one thought that I actually picked mm -hmm. from the speech that French President Macron gave in Klopsek in, in Bratislava. I don't know, Caroline or Peter, if you were in, in Bratislava. I, I wasn't there, but the speech is worth uh, reading. Because what uh, the French president is offering for Europe is not just what the French always say, that we need to increase our strategic autonomy when it comes to defense and, and, and everything. But he's also suggesting that France could offer the Europe, the European community, EU, a deep strike, uh, deep strike uh, capability, capacity. I think it's worth uh, paying attention to, to this offer because I also believe like the French president and like our strategic compass is pointing that the EU must develop it, its own uh, strengths and we have to become one day independent from United States. We want to have a strong transatlantic uh, um, connection. Uh, the United States is absolutely vital for us. But like the French president said in Klopsek, we cannot pre be reliant on the mood of the American voters. So the EU must be more capable. And, and the, the idea of having a better European deterrence, a better European deep strike uh, capability is, is worth elaborating a bit more. Thank you so much. I had the pleasure uh, to actually be in Bratislava uh, for that speech, and we have also the Vice President of Globsec with us in a panel uh, later on. But, Excellent. Um, let me, let me um, maybe also pick up a little bit uh, from, from this, uh, because it was uh, uh, interpreted as a, as a recognition of the Central and Eastern European perspective, which has probably not been uh, always the case in, in recent times within the European Union. But now, if we, if we look back, um, um, no, if we look into the future, um, also from a, from a Western European uh, country, what do you think could be other um, security challenges and that what should the EU be um, aware of from the standpoint of, of Ireland? Well, I think we have a number of challenges. I think if you look uh, over a five-year period, I think we have had, through the EU, you know, four once-in-a-generation type events happen in just five years. Anyone that has lived through, a, through right across a geopolitical situation where we've had a global pandemic, we've had the first war on mainland, mainland Europe in so long, we've had Brexit, which has been a massive challenge, and we have a climate emergency right facing down us into the future that we're trying to respond to. So I don't think we're short of challenges. The fact that those items happened in the space of five or six years just shows you how political leaders have had to respond in many, many challenging environments through COVID, which was very difficult to discharge your functions, and we had to find ways and means. And I think we've learned so much in the EU from the last financial crisis. I think really the way we put the mechanism together to do the Resilience and Recovery Fund, so quickly we did that instrument, really to stick together as a community, displayed that there is huge capacity in the EU now when the chips are on the table to respond and respond in a scale that will make, difference, make a huge difference to citizens uh, right across the European Union. The challenges are varied then into the future, as I said, really in terms of the varied nature of threats in terms of warfare through disinformation, which is very significant through social media, which we have to be very conscious of. Also, as I said, in relation to cyber and the fact that we have so many communication cables, our, the nature of our public infrastructure is ever changing. And over the next decade in our country, it's going to change vastly as we really try and you know, harness the huge amount of offshore renewable energy that we have, trying to get to 80% renewables by 2030. We've put into primary legislation the Fit for 55 package, hoping to meet that, uh, and our targets are being monitored every single year as a government. And that's hugely challenging, but it will be directly impacted by the threats that we face and that we have to respond to. And notwithstanding that, you have the issues of migration, which we have to uh, respond to, and transforming our economy, which in the time scale we have to do it is so urgent. So I don't think we'll be short of challenges, but what gives me great hope is that the EU really 
got its act together through COVID. I think we learned so much from that compared to what happened uh, back in 2007, 2008, where almost citizens' distrust in Europe was fed uh, because some countries felt very isolated. Uh, people and citizens in those countries had to put up with a huge amount of hardship. But now we've got better at really protecting our citizens, I think, and hopefully through the strategic compass and all those uh, initiatives will assist us to be a more better, more inclusive Europe, uh, which, again, we can really restate our values in and you know, really work together as a community. Thank you very, very much. Um, I think it was a remarkable panel, not only because we're on a ship and moving, but uh, we have been discussing very, very uh, timely and interesting topics from very interesting perspectives. Thank you so much, Minister Ed Stadler, Minister Berg, and former Minister Tupu <laughs> um, I, I, I learned a lot. Um, I gained a lot of insights. I think um, everyone else on that ship uh, did so too. So a big round of applause uh, for these insights. Thank you very much. So um, now, as we're still moving into, into one direction and not have returned uh, yet, we will uh, continue to look at uh, the European level. We have heard a lot from different EU member countries. I learned also a lot from uh, countries that I normally, in my capacity, don't deal uh, that much with. And uh, we learned a lot about uh, security. I think it's now time to bring also the European level on uh, that stage and find a connection to um, democracy and demography. And therefore, I'm very, very happy that we have with us the head of cabinet of the vice president of the European Commission, Dubravka Schuica, who is responsible for democracy and demography. And with us today is Colin Schikluna. Welcome to the stage. I don't mind having the Austrian flag. At no, all. I just want to, <laughs> to add also the, the European flag, maybe. Thank you very much. Um, in fact, I think my, my job has been made much easier um, by, the, by the previous three speakers, because I think um, you know, there are a number of conclusions I would draw from, from uh, what was said in this panel, but one of them certainly is that you know, the European Union is, is there, is an actor, is, is very present. And I think if we, if we look at, uh, at the media sometimes, we might get the impression that, that there is a lot of disunity, that the European Union is constantly uh, being challenged and, uh, and is unable to, uh, to move, to move ahead. But in reality, we have a very different situation because I think that the recent crises that were mentioned by the, uh, by the distinguished speakers um, have shown just not only how united the European Union can be, but also how determined the European Union can be. And, uh, and I think, you know, one, one thing that struck me a lot when I was hearing the speakers is, you know, the discussion on neutrality. And in a sense, um, sometimes the accusation of neutrality, but in reality, I think, we should also appreciate that neutrality doesn't mean indifference. And I think we have shown this very clearly, that the European Union, with the wide variety of views, with the wide variety of histories, and, uh, and, and the different approaches that we bring to the different files, we have shown that we are able to act together and we are able to, to achieve very, very important uh, objectives together. We talk a lot about security. And uh, we've recently, even in the European Commission, adopted various strategies, and which we are now discussing with, uh, with the member states, on economic security, on cyber security, on energy security. And I think there's some work coming up, which I would actually describe as values security. And this was also mentioned 
during the during the debate that the the war in Ukraine, the aggression against Ukraine, is also an attack on values, on our values. Um, at the moment, we're working on what we call the Defense of Democracy Package, which we will be adopting later this year. And this package will include a number of, of aspects. It will range from the, uh, the very real problem, the very real challenge of uh, covert hostile foreign interference in, uh, in electoral processes, for example, in, uh, in the spreading of misinformation and disinformation. But it will also address what we call the strengthening of democratic resilience. Because we think we, I think we would all agree that it's very important that we also um, create a situation where European citizens can not only feel a part of their democracy, but that they can actually contribute to the strengthening of it. And Minister Erstattler mentioned the Conference of the Future of Europe on a number of occasions. And uh, this is something that we were, the Bravka Schwitz and myself were very much involved in. And I think there, there were many, many lessons that we could draw. I, I would say it's rather unfortunate that it didn't gain the visibility that it mm. deserved. But in reality, the process itself was one that delivered very meaningful results. And uh, on the one hand, we saw that citizens are very um, interested. They really want to nurture and they want to protect their democratic space. We also saw, because the discussion was on security and security in the, in the external co context, excuse me, that one of the discussions was on the place of the European Union and the world. And the Conference on the Future of Europe actually came up with uh, a number of proposals on this. And we can dilute various messages from the proposals that came initially from citizens. These were essentially randomly selected citizens from all over Europe who came up with a number of proposals which they then discussed with parliamentarians, with ministers, with civil society and, uh, and others. And if we look at what this, in a way, unique democratic exercise came up with in this context, they were asking us for four things. The first one was they wanted to reduce our dependency on, on external actors. So what we call strategic autonomy or open strategic autonomy, and that leads into the discussion that very often is reduced to EU or NATO, when in reality it isn't an either or. Very clearly, a strong EU inside NATO is, is a win-win for everybody. The second point they were asking was that the European Union should adopt and should um, promote ethical standards in, in trade, in environment, in, in many sectors in the international arena. So protecting the rules-based order, which is also something that is under threat at the moment, because we don't only have the aggression by Russia, we also have other actors in the international and the geopolitical scene who are threatening this rule-based order. The third request was that we should be able to speak with one voice and we should be more effective in our decision making. And this is something that was also mentioned in the panel before. And the last one, um, perhaps in a way more important than all of them, is that they said citizens need to be kept informed and need to be involved in these debates. And again, I think that what we heard earlier was very much in that direction. So I would say um, as an outcome of all of this, is that I, I feel very encouraged with, uh, with to hear this, this kind of discussion coming from eminent speakers like those we had earlier. Thank you very much. That's, uh, that's uh, um, a good conclusion of the overall uh, first panel. I think we also are boarding at the moment and we'll have to unfortunately say goodbye to our ministers and former minister panel. Um, thank you very much again for being with us and I think we can give not only a big round of applause again for our first panel, but also for our um, intervention from the European Commission. Thank you very much, Colin Schluner.
Lena Kutzko and Elizabeth Bra. Please. Okay, and we, we will also get some, some. I think that's that's a kickoff, yeah, from now. Okay. <laughs> um, yes. So we have uh, we have actually now almost all the way back to Krems to discuss, and we have even a little bit more of time because uh, one of the the challenges that I initially uh, mentioned. Um, is also with regards to infrastructure and one of our panelists, uh, Nico Lange, who very much wanted to be here, um, he uh, wanted to come by train from Germany and uh, was prevented to do so. So um, we will uh, unfortunately discuss without him, but I think um, we will be more than um, happy to have a little bit more time to discuss maybe one or the other uh, question. Let me briefly introduce our panel a little bit more in detail and um, we uh, have with us uh, Lukas Mandel who is uh, the vice chair of the subcommittee on security and defense in the European Parliament he's also in the assembly of the European regions the chair of the delegation for relations with the Korean Peninsula and um, I'm very happy that we can uh, talk again because we just two weeks ago had a wonderful uh, panel discussion with some of his colleagues. Lucas, thank you for joining again. Never change your winning team, you would say. I would say so, yeah, <laughs> thank you. Um, this was we, also a microphone test. Yeah. Um, microphone test. <laughs> this one. Never change a functioning uh, microphone. <laughs> <laughs> it, it did function before, no? no this was mine. Mine, mine was fine. Yeah. But now legislation yeah. maybe doesn't need a microphone because we have our voice. <laughs> <laughs> One, two, three. No. No. Contest. No. Doesn't work. Okay. Not anyway. Yeah, I will try. I will try to. Do we have? I think we have others here. No. Let me try this. One, two. Ah. Oh. Uh huh. Okay. What a microphone. <laughs> So once again, thank you for joining. We have uh, with us uh, also um, from, well, I, I always say when I say something about uh, Globsec from, from neighboring Bratislava, because I'm normally in Vienna, but right now we are actually not that, but it's, uh, yeah, it's the same Danube, that's true. Um, nevertheless, uh, not only the proximity, but also the, the long-standing cooperation that we have and uh, uh, also the, the wonderful uh, cooperation that we have in various ways makes me very happy that you accepted to join us uh, on this panel. Alena is Vice President for Policy and Programming at Globsec, um, a, a, a global think tank uh, based in Bratislava, and uh, she focuses on European and transatlantic relations, security, and migration, has worked in Belarus, Estonia, Hungary, in foreign relations, democratization, and community development. Alena, thank you very much for joining us. Do you want to test your microphone as well? <laughs> I, I think the microphone works. Ah, very good, very good. And last uh, but not least, um, we have next to me Elizabeth Bra. Elizabeth uh, worked at Control Risks, a global risk consultancy, is, um, was a senior research fellow at the Royal United Services Institute in London until 2020 and then founded and led uh, the, the Modern Deterrence Project there. And uh, currently is a senior fellow at the American Enterprise Institute. Apart from that, also a columnist at uh, Political Europe and uh, for foreign policy, a member of the steering committee of the Aurora Forum, a member of the National Preparedness Commission in the United Kingdom, and an associate fellow at the European Leadership Network. Thank you, Elizabeth, for uh, joining us today. Now, um, I would like to start off the round with the general questions to all three of you. And um, the occasion is, of course, that uh, some sort of, I mean, there have been a lot of historic dates in, in recent times. 
Uh, but exactly one year ago, Ukraine and the Republic of Moldova became uh, candidate countries to the European Union. And uh, if, we, if we look uh, back and uh, also take, into, uh, take this into consideration, um, how did the developments after this full-scale invasion by the Russian Federation um, change the, the, the current unity and solidarity in the EU and wider Europe? What would you say, looking back one year after that candidate country status for those two countries, um, where are we standing now? Elizabeth, do you want to start us off? Please, please. Okay. Um, actually, first of all, I would like to invite everybody who's upstairs <laughs> to, to come down uh, because there are a few seats left and you'll be able to, to participate more actively if you are down here. We will open the floor for questions as well later on, then, yeah? <laughs> if that helps. Uh, okay, you have been given op yeah. the option. Um, I'll make a related point, Sebastian, by the way. It's so nice that, that the moderator has the same name as my son. You know, <laughs> uh, uh, the organizers couldn't have picked a better moderator. Um, the, the point I'd like to make uh, is, uh, it, it, and it relates to, to the future of Moldova and Ukraine within the European Union, but we have just seen uh, the conclusion of uh, the um, the reconstruction conference in London mm -hmm. on uh, that that will hopefully see Ukraine become a viable economy uh, once again or become an even more viable economy than it was uh, even uh, when when Russia invaded and I think what is so uh, absolute actually <laughs> uh, the group upstairs if you'd like to come closer you'll be able to hear. So uh, what is so important about this conference is that the future of Ukraine is not just about governments and it's not just about governmental processes. The same thing goes for Moldova. It's also about the involvement of the private sector. And I think this is, this is an area that is, is maybe often overlooked in, in policy circles, not this time, but often in policy circles. Uh, the private sector is absolutely uh, indispensable, and I remember vividly on the 15th of February, I think everybody remembers on the 14th of February, Russia said that they were pull pulling back from the Ukrainian border. Uh, and um, and I, I, uh, on the 15th, I thought, I'm going to check what the shipping industry makes of this, because the shipping industry is obviously absolutely essential to Ukraine's economy, because it is the shipping industry that gets uh, all Ukrainian, most Ukrainian cargo out of the country. So on the 15th of February, I checked with the global shipping industry's uh, decision-making body that sets the risk level for uh, the shipping industry. And if you are in the highest risk level as a country, uh, which Somalia is, Libya is, and so forth, then it's very difficult for shipping companies to ship anything in and out of your waters because it's, uh, they, they can't get insurance. So on the 15th of February, I, I uh, asked uh, the, the global shipping industries uh, shipping insurance industry's uh, risk-setting body, what they made of Russia's uh, announcement that it was pulling back. And I think we all remember that we all were pretty pleased that Russia had said it was pulling back from the border, and we were very hopeful that, that a war could be averted. But this uh, uh, industry body in the shipping industry, uh, they met on the 15th of February for an emergency session and they elevated the risk level for Ukraine to the highest level, well actually for, for the Ukrainian parts of the Black Sea and the Sea of uh, Azov and also for the Russian parts. Uh, they met on the 15th and raised Ukraine's and Russia's uh, risk level to the highest level which is where uh, Somalia is, Libya and, and I think also the waters of Lebanon. Uh, so that made it virtually impossible for, uh, for shipping companies to ship in and out of, of, of those waters anymore. And it was so interesting, I thought, because uh, the industry, the insurance industry, clearly had a better sense of whether Russia was planning to invade than most of us did, because uh, everybody else was, or most of us were, were actually uh, quite pleased that Russia seemed uh, unlikely to invade. The industry, the insurance industry, thought otherwise. And that's why it matters so much uh, 
they, uh, they also, uh, uh, companies also pulled out of Ukraine. The Ukrainian currency started doing very badly. Uh, it became very uh, expensive to insure against the Ukrainian um, sovereign default and so forth. And all of that matters so much because if people don't believe, in, uh, if people, if the industry doesn't believe in the future of Ukraine, then they're not going to invest there. And then Ukraine, uh, yes, uh, the, the war may end and, and hopefully will end. But if there is no industry belief or, or faith in the future of the Ukrainian economy, then it's not going to be a viable country, which is why this conference matters so much. And that's the same thing goes for Moldova. If the private sector, if the insurance industry, which may seem terribly boring, yes, it is. It is boring, but it's absolutely indispensable. If they don't believe uh, that uh, the Moldovan, uh, in the, in the Moldovan economy has a future, then uh, the Moldovan, uh, Moldovan eco economy won't have a future. And, and so I think that's, that's really important to bear in mind if we're talking about the accession, potential accession of, of uh, Moldova and, and Ukraine to the European Union, that it starts with that trust uh, in the private sector that these countries, their economies are viable. Thank you so much. Um, Alena, unity and solidarity that we have never seen before, is this so slowly becoming a phrase that we are hearing or would you still see that it is happening? From the very beginning of, in, on, of the invasion, I've heard the same phrase over and over every month. Everybody was saying, okay, um, give it another month, another couple of weeks, and you will start falling apart and the solidarity will go away. Putin definitely thought the same, and they tried various things. There was the logic that, okay, we'll flood the EU with Ukrainian migrants, you will suffer, get scared, fall apart. We'll cut off energy, the same thing will happen. We'll do cyber attacks, disinformation, we'll cut the grain and food supplies. EU was supposed to fall apart and stop supporting Ukraine a long time ago, and we're still doing it. That gives me a lot of hope that this will continue. And there are a lot of factors why I think, at least for now, the trend will stand. If we look at the public opinion polls, still there is a huge support for Ukraine. There is a huge level of understanding who is to blame for the war. And because people saw what kind of regime and future Russia and Putin represent, it's much clearer for them what exactly they're fighting for right now in terms of supporting Ukraine. But also there is another factor. A lot of things that the EU has done are very sticky. EU has set a lot of precedents in terms of what kind of funds we can create, how quickly we can react, how flexible we can be. And these mechanisms can be used in the future, maybe for Ukraine, for Moldova, but for all other different scenarios as well. So public support and this precedent setting and the ability to recycle, reuse, rely on the mechanism that we developed gives me a lot of hope for the future as well. But of course, it's important to remember that this year, I think there's gonna be elections literally all over Europe and also the United States and elections in democratic countries are never a done deal until the very last moment. So there will be a lot of people who will try to say something different. There is gonna be a lot of disinformation and influence operations also from Russia, but maybe from many other countries. So we definitely need to watch out for the future as well. But of course, what will be also decisive is what we do internally, but going back to Ukraine and Moldova, people will be looking at what's going on also on the Ukrainian battlefield, because for people it's important to see that what we're doing for Ukraine is paying off, that, we're, that Ukraine keeps winning and not losing, but also it will be important what kind of reforms Ukraine and Moldova are doing. So far the record is pretty good, uh, it's amazing what both countries managed to achieve given the very difficult circumstance in which they win. And as long as this traje trajectory continues, I do think that there, the solidarity in the EU will continue. Thank you, Elena. Lucas, you feel that in your daily work, how the solidarity and unity is uh, functioning in the European Parliament. Would you share that uh, the, the assessment that this is still going strong, and um, would you also um, maybe share a little bit what the situation regarding this candidacy of those two countries are debated um, amongst parla parliamentarians? Actually, there are three. Bosnia and Herzegovina also uh, gained candidate status formally because I'm not a big fan of this bureaucratic approach of uh, granting a candidate status, waiting for accession negotiations, bureaucratically negotiate on chapter by chapter, no matter whether it's the old methodology or the new methodology, it didn't work. 
just didn't work. But this is not our topic today. But uh, we just found out uh, in the small talk before that uh, the 10 years after Croatia's accession to EU is the longest period of time without an accession to EU in history. So this is very telling. This is very telling. We are losing ground here. But to go to your question, uh, I would say yes. Unity is there. But I, what I always call it is the year of beginnings. It was a year, it's already nearly one and a half year, of many good beginnings, I would say. Uh, it was already mentioned today that not only Austria, but also other member states uh, increased their defense budgets. Uh, we, um, let's say, take the strategic compass, which was developed before the military fully-fledged war, because the war began 2014, as we all know, but military fully-fledged war, beside the hybrid warfare against all of us, began February 24 last year. So uh, we take the strategic compass more serious. We strengthen uh, the European Peace Facility, and we use it for its purpose, actually. Um, we also maybe have a more accurate uh, approach to the transatlantic relation. We again have the lesson, uh, hopefully learned, uh, that uh, as in the Balkan wars, we again need uh, the transatlantic relation in order to sort out things within our own continent. Hopefully uh, we will not have one more occasion, but when we will have, or if we will have one more occasion, we will be capable to do it ourselves. So I'm very much in favor of what's called strategic autonomy or open strategic resilience, as the new Brussels language calls it. So we have many good beginnings. Uh, but it's only beginnings yet, so there is a lot uh, to be done in order to strengthen what we uh, have uh, be begun here. And uh, overall, uh, I'm confident, maybe more confident than before this fully-fledged military war, that uh, things can work out well, because it's true that not in Moscow and not in Brussels and not anywhere in the European Union, maybe nowhere, it was expected that Europe could act as unified as it actually has been acting since February 24 last year. Thank you so much. I will uh, ask another round of uh, questions to my panelists, but then you can already prepare yourself uh, to ask questions also um, to the panel, please. Uh, Elizabeth, you have mentioned shipping companies, and I mean, we are on a ship, we're on the Danube. Um, yeah, well, there, you know, we, we invited you because of your expertise and also because you can tell us a bit more about what uh, the future of the Black Sea Grain Deal uh, will look like, because there has been this discussion also that the Danube might be an alternative for shipping routes and to, to help to alleviate this situation. Um, can you, can you tell us more about uh, the current status here? Um, the, the grain deal, not the shipping of the Danube per se, um, but feel free to, to also comment on that. And um, why is that so important for, for global food security? Yeah, I think uh, w we all know how absolutely crucial uh, Ukraine and Ukrainian agriculture is, is to uh, the food security, around, food security around the world, uh, but uh, Ukrainian farmers uh, planting uh, seeds and, and harvesting that's uh, harvesting uh, the the grain that's just the beginning and and actually uh, this war I, th I, th I hope has been a useful reminder to all of us of the enormous logistics that goes into uh, agriculture into growing the food we eat, uh, transporting it to where it needs to be, and what happens if it doesn't reach us. Uh, actually, <laughs> it, 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 what happens if it doesn't reach us is a disaster, which is why the grain deal is so important, and, and it, it really is incredible, and a testimony to, of all people, President Erdogan, who may have his faults, but he did, uh, uh, he did manage to negotiate this deal, and uh, he was, I think, almost the only person who could have negotiated, negotiated it, because he has this incredible unique position uh, in in global politics and he is uh, often uh, well he's a maverick and often an, an unhelpful one but on this occasion uh, it, the grain deal was uh, an incredible success to the diplomacy by him and the United Nations and obviously Ukraine and Russia um, and if I may add, the, the other component there is the willingness, again, of the shipping company to be part of it, the shipping industry to be part of it, um, and that involves uh, 
the in shipping insurance industry being uh, willing to provide insurance even under these really perilous circumstances. Yes, there is a, there is a shipping lane, a green lane that the, the ships sail through, but the, the insurance companies had to be willing to, to put their faith in uh, the fact that there were no mines in this lane. And that, that is a big leap of faith during a war, uh, but they did that. And it really is an incredible uh, feat of cooperation during an ongoing war that all this happened and that we can get uh, grain as a result, but it's not to be taken for granted. Uh, the shipping insurance companies can decide at any given point that, oh, maybe the green lane is, is not uh, as, as safe as, as it needs to be for us to insure. Shipping companies can decide that it's, it's not worth the risk. Shipping crews can decide that it's not worth the risk for them. We all just assume that, that uh, goods will reach us. Actually, there is a, a crew crisis in the, in the global shipping industry. How many here, uh, how, how, many people, people, how many people in the room know anybody who has gone to sea? A few, <laughs> because we are in the Danube region. Uh, yay for the Danube! <laughs> yay for the Danube region. Uh, other than other than the people, uh, maybe in the Danube region, it's very unusual to go to sea. So we, to, for, for ocean shipping today, we rely on India, the Philippines, Indonesia, and if and China. But the the uh, Chinese crew uh, mostly uh, crew Chinese ships, and also Russia and Ukraine. And what would happen if Indians decided, oh, it's not worth the risk anymore? It is a very dangerous profession. What what would happen if, if um, uh, Philippine uh, uh, seafarers decided the same? Um, uh, Indonesian ones, we would not get the goods that we depend on. So, uh, and the, the, uh, that's uh, also true for the for the grain deal. What if if the crew members on the ships that transport the the Ukrainian grain decided that actually I just don't want to risk uh, sailing through the, the 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 green lane because who knows what what may be in the green lane? Maybe there are mines. Uh, we depend on all of these components, and and. I, it is a, an extremely useful reminder of the enormously complicated and impressive logistics that go into the global supply chains, but of, of which uh, getting Ukrainian grain to us under ordinary circumstances and uh, during this war uh, are an important part. And uh, I hope it will make us appreciate uh, how, uh, what, what a, a feat this, uh, the Ukrainian grain deal is and how perilous it is because any component may uh, stop working at any given point, and then we won't have the Ukrainian grain deal. Thank you. Alina, um, we have mentioned also in the discussion already the, the various other ways that uh, the solidarity, uh, the, the attempts to break the solidarity have been um, undertaken by um, the regime in Moscow. And one of the things that, that also you mentioned is uh, the migration factor. And... Um, do you think that uh, we need to re-evaluate uh, the EU's migration policies, considering the consequences of uh, the war and uh, the migration flows that result uh, from this? I think we already are re-evaluating re European migration policies. Probably one of the most surprising outcomes for everybody during this war is that Central European countries that in the previous waves of migration earned this reputation of being very unfriendly towards migrants, proved to be rather welcoming and actually capable to set up uh, infrastructure, so social infrastructure, physical reception facilities, integration system to make sure that Ukrainians are welcome, that they can quickly go on the labor market, that they receive social support, that kids can go to school. And it's not actually very easy because a lot of people who are coming from Ukraine, they're by definition either women with children and elderly, so it's a lot of strain also on the social system in the countries, but they have managed to do that. Which means that there is new discovery in the European Union that some of the fears that we had about migration are actually very manageable and we can cope with them. But of course, as in every situation, there are a lot of buts. There is no guarantee, and actually I'm pretty sure that the same approach we have towards Ukrainians is not automatically transferable to people from other countries of origin for various combination of reasons, including how we 
uh, relate to the uh, reasons for people to come and where people are coming from. But that said, I think there is also, because there has been so much attention on migration, and because there is now uh, understanding that migration is not going to stop also from other directions, you probably noticed that there has been recently a, uh, an attempt to reform also European asylum system uh, to make sure that uh, there is either uh, more speedy ways to uh, distribute the people who are coming to Europe between the countries. Some blocks have been overcome. For example, people who were very much against the redistribution schemes finally agreed that at least they can fin uh, contribute financially. But there are also some agreements in terms of how to make sure that we can return people who are unfortunately or fortunately not eligible for asylum in Europe to other countries where they can come from. So this re-evaluation re is also happening. But also I think what was important for people to understand and it's not just because the war, but it's also because COVID and all other economic problems, more and more Europeans understand that we have demographic problems and that we need both skilled and unskilled migrants. So there is more awareness also in the EU that we need to make sure that we have legal pathways for people to come. Of course, that does not mean that Europeans suddenly say, everybody who wants to come, please come. Europeans are becoming a bit more selective in terms of what kind of people they want, what for and where but there is still already some change in the migration approach that we're observing in Europe right now. Thank you, Alina. I'm, I promise you will be asking the next question. I just um, want to ask one more question to Lucas. Um, as, as the vice chair of the subcommittee on security and defense, I'm also bringing back maybe the overall topic of this Danube Salon with uh, the security compass. Um, what is your opinion on that? How challenging was it to bridge the different perceptions of security threats from the different member states, but also maybe political parties? First of all, I want to point out that we are just crossing Dürnstein, which is also giving the name for the ship we are on today. Uh, and uh, Dürnstein is the place where uh, Richard the Lionheart, uh, English king, was captured uh, in the end of the 12th century and a huge amount of money had to be paid to get him free. And with this money, Wiener Neustadt was founded, which is, uh, the, with a little self-confidence, I can say, the West Point of Austria. Yeah. So the, the play, <laughs> some are laughing. <laughs> so it's uh, where, where uh, Austrian military officials uh, would be trained uh, in Wiener Neustadt. And uh, thanks to the British, uh, or the English that time, we had this money. But uh, we, we released him, and uh, he turned back to England alive, uh, at least something. So this was the 12th century, and this is Dürnstein. So this is the touristic part of it, maybe also telling. There are different approaches to the question of security risks. And uh, I also want to emphasize that, uh, as always in history, one must not underestimate the hidden risks when everybody is talking about Russia's war. There are hidden risks. Islamism is one. What's happening in Syria is one. Iran is not only supporting Russia, but a huge number of different, uh, let's say, endeavors against our civilization. So uh, the, strateg uh, the strategic compass is more or less covering uh, these risks and defining them, but uh, political practice, as we all know, is always something different, and we have to be prepared in all these different fields. Uh, and that's why uh, in our, for example, uh, special committee on foreign interference and disinformation, we worked out at least a pattern of how the, uh, the services of the member states can closer work together, how EEAS, the European External Action Service, uh, can uh, create some capabilities here and also uh, create more connection to the parliament as in other parliamentary democracies, there's much more connection between the services and the parliamentary uh, bodies, I would say. So these are approaches we, we have to see and uh, some endeavors we have to undertake uh, because of different security uh, uh, risks. And I have one fear, I would say, uh, connecting to your question what different approaches of member states or political groups would be to security risks is it's generally that we get used to the war and that uh, we again will forget how quickly things can change and we will again, uh, let's, let's say, lose pace in creating uh, a more resilient environment. 
And as it was discussed today, uh, what NATO's role would be, what EU's role would be, I always emphasize that there is no, and there has not been any NATO enlargement. That's a wrong expression in my view, because it's not NATO a body which would have enlarged itself somewhere. No, it's individual member states who uh, signed this insurance. It's an insurance. And uh, when it comes to role of EU and NATO for European countries, I would say NATO is the insurance in the case of war, and uh, EU is there to preserve peace uh, as much as possible. And both will be needed, and that's why it's true what has been said, uh, that uh, more or less EU is already covered in NATO and will be more covered in NATO than ever before. And strategic resilience and strategic autonomy, of course, is it's not uh, uh, parallel to NATO. It's complementary with NATO, and that's something we always have to tell our transatlantic friends. If we, if we develop something, uh, it's within NATO and it's within this framework of security for all the free world, the political West. And it was also interesting what the Finnish parliamentarian, by the way, she was promoted to parliament. She was a minister before and now she's a parliamentarian. Really, I have to really emphasize this parliamentary approach. It was an interesting discussion. Um, actually, she's even heading the Foreign Affairs Committee of this important country with 1,300 1, kilometers border with Russia, obviously. So uh, that's something. And what she, what she said, I, I wasn't aware of that, uh, that clearly, that Macron obviously uh, offered... Uh, to grant from the side of France for EU, uh, I guess what she said was a strong uh, strike capability or something. Whatever this might be, maybe this has to be discussed. But uh, but if it uh, it's really meant that way by Macron, uh, then this is something, even if I'm critical against all executive branch people, <laughs> as you can imagine, as I already emphasized, but also critical on Macron. But uh, this could be something. Um, and this could be a step forward, but never parallel to NATO, or even, of course, not against NATO, but complementary with NATO. And let's just keep up the public attention for the importance of these insurances and of the importance of uh, preserving peace, which means an active uh, 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 activity, so to speak, because uh, peace has been attacked also via hybrid means and measures, as we all know, and democracy has been attacked via hybrid means and measures, and we have to we have to do a lot to preserve peace also in, in that field. Thank you so much. Yes, please, Elizabeth, come. Uh, since the Irish minister has left, yeah. I thought I would uh, add one comment. Uh, and he, he talked a lot about the need for infrastructure protection. And I think we all remember uh, when Russia, a, a few months ago, about a year ago, was going to conduct a naval exercise uh, off the coast of Ireland. Who, who remembers this? Yeah. And, and Ireland, uh, the Irish government uh, pleaded with Russia not to conduct this military exercise. And of course, Russia uh, went ahead and, and, uh, with the planning anyway, because if you don't have a strong navy, you can plead as much as you like. The, the other side won't, won't pay much attention to you. So it was, I have to return to, to the maritime theme here, it was Irish fishermen, I think we all remember Irish fishermen who uh, managed to stave off this Russian exercise. And, uh, and they did so uh, by uh, I, I demonstrating, I think, the most uh, incredibly innovative deterrence thinking you could ever imagine. Irish fishermen, who uh, nobody would think of as, as strategic thinkers in national security, but it is, I think, a salutary lesson for all of us uh, that Irish fishermen managed to stave off, this, uh, stave off this Russian naval exercise, and they did so by putting all their ships out in the water uh, around the clock. They took, uh, they took uh, turns having them there, which meant that there was no space for Russian ships to conduct their exercise. Brilliant uh, deterrence by the Irish fishermen, but they can't help the Irish government every time there is a crisis. And there was a crisis just a few weeks ago when some other Russian ships, including a, a, a warship, turned up and parked it themselves on top of infrastructure undersea cables in Ireland's exclusive economic zone. And, and Ireland once again, so, or the Irish government once again said, oh, we're going to monitor it. Uh, but there, if monitoring it just isn't good enough uh, because if you monitor it uh, 
if you discover they are up to no good, what are you going to do uh, if you don't have any capabilities? Um, and you can't hope that your, your fishermen will, will come to your aid every time. Uh, but it does illustrate uh, the need for uh, public-private cooperation when it comes to infrastructure protection. Maybe uh, the infrastructure companies themselves could have a little bit of, of uh, patrolling on top of their uh, on top of their undersea cables and other uh, offshore and indeed onshore infrastructure. Thank you, um, Alina. I'm sure you want to chip in as well, but now I have to go to that gentleman over there because his neighbor is otherwise going to uh, be very upset um, if I don't let him ask the question. Please, can you? First of all, say who you are, and then second of all, who you are addressing the question to. Uh, oh, I'm, I'm going to have that. Absolutely. <laughs> Hi, I'm Matthias Ketzemann. I'm a uh, professor of innovation law in Innsbruck, and one of the areas I'm focusing on is hybrid threats. So I would really appreciate the um, comments of the panel on the question of how the, um, let's say, the, the, the internet-based and non-internet-based, kinetic and non-kinetic threats emerging from Russia against Ukraine have changed how the European Union addresses uh, online-based uh, threats, how the diplomatic toolbox is being used, how the um, online resilience concept is being changed. That would be a question I'd be really uh, keen to, to hear some, some, uh, some of your views on. Thank you so much. Thank you. <laughs> Please, uh, whoever wants to go first. <laughs> okay. Since since uh, gray zone aggression is my uh, my area of work, um, so uh, every every war is a hybrid war because hybrid is a combination of kinetic and, and non kinetic. But I think what what everybody has discovered since the beginning of the Ukraine war is that you can achieve, and indeed just before the Ukraine war, is that you can achieve a great deal uh, by just using tools below the threshold of armed military aggression. And you don't even have to use uh, uh, little green men. That's sort of a, a thing of the past. You can, you can use a lot of online tools. And I, I, I think the, the fantastic thing is that lots of governments are, are experimenting, trying to think of, of ways uh, that they can increase uh, societal resilience. Um, and they are, if the, the Finnish government, for example, is uh, is uh, trying to uh, to improve um, information literacy across the board, not just for not just for young people. Uh, I think people of our age are are as vulnerable to disinformation as children are, um, and uh, we we need to learn as well. Um, so all of that is happening, uh, and there is a lot of work happening trying to figure out what what the uh, the responsibility of the private sector should be. Should they should there be legislation asking them to do more? Uh, should there should there be some sort of a voluntary uh, agreement? But the, I think that the, the the bottom line is that it's very difficult for politicians to tell the public. Now you have to take more responsibility. Which minister would say that? Actually, I should have asked the ministers here. <laughs> uh, which minister would want to tell the public, now the time has come for you to take responsibility for some, something other than yourself? And it, 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 it's a difficult sell, especially after 35 years, almost 35 years of, of people being asked, not, uh, not being asked to do anything for anybody other than themselves. So I think the ideas are there, the concepts are there, but who's going to ask the public to, to make this contribution to the collective good? Thank you. Uh, Alina, Lucas, do you want to also add I, to I, I can very quickly and actually elaborate on the po point that Elizabeth was making earlier about the uh, hybrid attacks and specifically cyber. And the point that I want to make is that first, cyber was supposed to be the area where Russians are doing much better, but it didn't change the course of the war significantly from the point of view how Russians would have wanted it, but it did change it from the point of view that Ukrainians were much more successful and much more resilient than anybody would have thought. And this is also a big lesson for Western countries. What Ukrainians definitely did very well is exactly the private partnership uh, that Elizabeth was talking about at the beginning. Already uh, shortly before the war and at the beginning of the war, Ukrainians at a tremendous speed managed to set up partnerships with the private companies to make sure that, for example, entire government data and operations are moved into the cloud that wouldn't have been possible without the private sector. Uh, cyber defense is pretty much, of course, 
provided partially by the Western countries, partially domestically by Ukrainians, but to a large degree by the private companies. And no country in the West, maybe except for the United States, has the capacity at the government level to make sure that they have 24-7 people who are dealing with the cyber threats that keep coming. So cyber, uh, cyber is one of the areas where private-public partnership will be fundamentally important. But also, uh, this is an interesting area because it shows how actually deterrence by the West is working. One of the theories why Russians have not been that uh, successful is that because the Ukrainians move the data to the cloud, because Western companies are providing support to Ukrainians, Russians are worried about retaliating against them or attacking also infrastructure because inadvertently they might also um, uh, hit the, either the Western companies or the Western government infrastructures because they cannot that precisely to identify the, uh, let's say, servers where the Ukrainian data is stored. So from that perspective, it still illustrates that the Western companies, because they have these private capabilities, are way more prepared than uh, the Russians are or potential other aggressor. But this is just the beginning and we definitely need to do much better in this area as well. Thank you. Lucas. Thank you. <clears throat> First of all, I want to emphasize what Elizabeth uh, has stated. Uh, because it's, uh, I totally agree, and it's a pity, even, I mean, that you have to say today that it would be impossible on European soil, maybe in the West generally, but especially on European soil, that a politician would address the public with the request to take more responsibility is a pity. Sorry, decades after John F. Kennedy has stated, uh, don't ask what, you, what your country can do for you, but what you can do for your country, we have this situation today. So what, what's really, really uh, the lack of today's uh, policies and politics is leadership. Uh, of course, requests like this will have to be in place in order to protect our civilization, to preserve it for the next generation and to develop it. I, I really mean it. Harbit attacks are present. Uh, as mentioned, we had this uh, special committee. We uh, finished it a few weeks ago uh, in the European Parliament against disinformation, foreign interference, and other things. I always tend to translate disinformation into what it really is. It's lies. That's the older expression. It's what they are doing is lying in a structural way, and um, I would say technically elaborated, but this is disinformation and foreign interference, and we see it in fields like uh, media, uh, influencing media, influencing populistic political movements, including NGOs, but also running uh, political bodies like parties, uh, also uh, via uh, money transfers. We see it online. Uh, cyber attacks is, uh, let's say, uh, as well a technical uh, uh, crime, but also uh, in social media, the attempt is to divide our societies, to divide our societies via misusing critical issues like migration, like climate change, like X, Y, Z, in order to cause division and to deepen division, and uh, like uh, the pandemic and the means and measures during the pandemic and so on. And uh, we will need education in order to put people in the position to check the plausibility of any kind of communication and information and, uh, and other means and measures uh, which were already mentioned. Uh, it's rather rare that an Austrian would praise something from Germany, but the Germans did very good uh, in dealing with that uh, during the Bundestag election, uh, the last one, last year, or the year before, in order to, to make the public aware of, uh, of threats online via conspiracy theories, via hate speech, via disinformation, via lies, and so on. Uh, and we have... Uh, uh, in the meantime, a good cooperation with the big social media platforms, uh, Meta and others, after January 6, 2021 on Capitol Hill, because then also, let's say, in uh, let's say the, the leadership country of the free world, they saw how quickly things can change, even riots can take place uh, in the very center of the world's democracy, I would say. Uh, via social media, hate speech, and uh, and so on, mobilization uh, via these channels. And this is why some kind of framework will be needed. And today, the social media platforms are our par uh, partners in this legacy, and also uh, American colleagues 
uh, on Capitol Hill are our partners because uh, everybody has understood now there is a threat to democracy. It's not only about the freedom of speech, which we protect here, as well as we protect uh, press freedom, as well as we protect democracy. Uh, via these means and measures, uh, we have to defend ourselves against these attacks, and it's by far not yet over. It's still, it's still a big threat, uh, and it's still open. Let's say where this will lead to, and whether we can preserve our civilization of democracy, human dignity, freedom, and rule of law. Thank you. We have uh, time for more questions. Yes, and I don't want to exclude the upper deck. Yeah? We'll make it happen if you want it. But I have over there, and then uh, the ambassador. Okay, thank you. Um, Julian Stockler, I'm with the German Council on Foreign Relations, where I work on a project called the Action Group Zeitenwende. Um, I would like to know how do you think could credible security guarantees to Ukraine look like? Is that again? It Go, goes to all of you. <laughs> okay. Well, then, Ambassador, I will come back to you in a, in a minute, but um, maybe can you briefly comment on it, whoever wants to? Really brief, but it's an important question. To be very frank, I have stated in the beginning, uh, and it's true, and it's time to tell the truth and to, to stick to facts, I would say we need US help. We have needed it since the beginning of this war. The unity is true, and uh, European contribution to freedom and peace is larger than everybody expected, or anybody expected, but without US we would already be lost. And this is why uh, I'm a bit... Um, concerned regarding the election in, in the US next year, as maybe everybody who looks deeper into it would be. Uh, security guarantee is a big uh, expression, but uh, what has to be made understood, and it's maybe something many of us do all the time, also in discussions at home and in Brussels and ev uh, everywhere, uh, to make understood that there is, and I don't like this word in German language, alternative laws, but there is really no alternative to defeating Putin Russia because the, the precedence of what's happening here would not be only, uh, let's say, hell for Ukraine, but for everybody, and for Europe, and for world order, uh, and for the values we try to uh, defend here. So this is why yeah, investment will be important, uh, also from the European side, and to, uh, to uphold this transatlantic relation and the relation with all the free world will be important to even, uh, let's say, uh, also contribute to the relation with our partners in Asia, especially South Korea, uh, and also to, to look after the, the, the partners of this Putin-Russia regime, which will become more and more important as, as weak uh, Putin-Russia will get. And, and Putin-Russia has been getting weaker due to sanctions, also everything else is disinformation about that, sanctions work, but partners, especially Iran, but also others will will uh, be uh, will need uh, our caretaking. I would say, in order to confront that risk and, uh, of course, to support the troops in Ukraine. By the way, also to support the troops in Ukraine via a, 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 a proper procedure of procurement uh, with a central procurement office or some office or some structure of transparency, in order to to really make sure that the money in its entirety reaches the troops which are fighting and which we need uh, for our freedom and uh, the troops will need the means and measures with the money and the money should go there uh, 100 percent. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Since the, the colleague from the Titan when they, um, stole my for, for wrap up question, feel free to <laughs> chip in on this already. I'll come up with something else <laughs> then. You have time to think about yeah. it. In terms of security guarantees for Ukraine, eventually, at some point in time, when the circumstances are different, of course, NATO is the best security guarantee. In the meantime, uh, the default option is to arm Ukraine to the teeth. The problem with that is that Western industries are not capable to even arm Europe and the US to the teeth with the speed with which we are producing weapons right now. So for that to happen, we need to invest significantly more already now and to scale the production capacities at home, including also the more conventional capabilities, but also think more about the future capabilities, starting from how we can enhance the uh, conventional capabilities with software, how we can look at cyber, and so on. So if that's the 
default option that everybody agrees upon, we need to start acting accordingly. But also, of course, what would be uh, extremely important for Ukraine is that security guarantees, especially those provided on the bilateral level, are provided not just by the Western countries. It's fundamentally important that some of the non-EU, uh, non-UK, not US, non-Canada countries are involved. Uh, and it can be Turkey, it can be some other countries about the world, but that would be uh, important also to make sure that any attacks in the future are, def uh, are deflected. Uh, but also, uh, of course, Ukrainians potentially closer to EU membership than NATO membership, and that is also a good sign. Europeans think that Europe is not that important for defense, but when it comes to securing our own investments, our own uh, economic structures, there will be very different approach to make sure that Ukraine is secure if Ukraine is properly integrated in Europe. So at this later stage, I'm sure it can be upgraded also to either proper NATO membership or even stronger security guarantees by Europeans. Thank you. Elizabeth, do you want to answer that as well? Uh, not on the security guarantees, but... Uh, on the issue of, of arms production. And yeah. uh, I, I hear these figures all the time about how much needs to be invested. Uh, and I always want to know who is going to be the factory workers who are actually going to produce these weapons. We have a, uh, we have a worker shortage in our existing factories and we're obviously trying to bring more factories uh, home. And, and so uh, it is, I think, once again, it illustrates uh, the vital importance of, uh, of uh, manual workers in our societies and it's it's fine for for us desk workers to to have opinions but if anything is going to happen whether it be shipping or arms manufacturing there have to be people operating uh, the machines and this is not unskilled work this is <laughs> this is uh, today's machines are are very complicated and we're talking about uh, about sophisticated weaponry who are these workers where are, where are they going to come from who is going to train them that won't happen quickly um, and uh, I, I, by the way, who remembers the Red Army faction? A few people. Uh, I remember vividly reading the, the famous book by uh, Stefan Aust years ago. Uh, and it, uh, at, at one point he describes how a couple of the Red Army faction members thought it would be a good idea, since they were fighting a revolution on behalf of the workers, that they, uh, f they thought it would be a good idea to go and try and be a worker themselves. Well, they lasted about one week in, in a factory because it's hard work. And, and so uh, <laughs> these are not jobs that will be easy to fill. And they are now... Uh, also very sophisticated jobs in, in the arms manufacturing industry. So it's just something to bear in mind if, we are, if we're talking about uh, the, the need to speed up uh, arms production. Thank you. So let's bring in um, Georgia here. The ambassador has a question. Can I hold it? Yes. I'm the ambassador of Georgia. And actually, I try to keep it short, yeah? But, uh, like, I, it's difficult, I, can, I have to tell you. But uh, there were many things uh, that I want to pick up and also maybe suggest you, uh, as Mr. Mandel here is here, and other speakers as well, to comment. You said something very important now, not to set a precedent and to defeat Putin in Russia. Because we all understand that Russian aggression is not... Uh, 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 just a geographic notion per se. We just discussed the hybrid threats and even if it was geographic, it's much beyond Ukraine, unfortunately. Ukraine has been the most brutal, massive and tragic, still ongoing uh, wake-up call or eye-opener for the rest of the world. We saw it coming already in 2008, not 2014, it was 2008 when the Russians started the first open military adventure to forcibly change the borders in Europe. But back then, whatever happened, it's the past. The reactions was different. We asked, I mean, collectively the West, maybe we did not understand Russia. There was a reset button pushed from overseas. You know, there was an engagement policy, um, uh, some red carpets in attempt to integrate Russia. But, you know, unlike, uh, unless you are very close and you have too long a relationship with, so with Russia, you may not know that in their vocabulary, words like compromise not exactly translate as we understand. For them, it was a green light. And then it happened what happened. So why I brought this, why the geographic uh, uh, picture into, into and uh, also why I stress that it's systemic, yeah? Precedent. I think when you discuss solidarity and unity and consistency of the European response, 
It's also very important to keep in mind that Russian aggressive policy has to get this response everywhere where it's resorted to, including Georgia. For us, it's a cheap solution, not costly, candidate status for the moment being, which would be a political statement. But I offer you at the roundup to have, I know the moderator is a little nervous as we're hitting the back, but um, in the roundup to look at the prospects of the European security that we have to together forge and to look at its different components, including Black Sea security, which is clearly set as a part of the European security in the uh, compass. Uh, how do you see this complex response geographically, but also systemically in terms of wider region of the Black Sea, including Georgia? Thank you very much. And uh, yeah, let's use this opportunity, because the compass has been brought up uh, as well, to have it as a final wrap up round also maybe with regards to the security uh, compass and us shipping on the Danube. Uh, we're gonna do this in reverse order. Lucas, please. Thank you. Of course, uh, I have mentioned candidate status, system, bureaucratic system, uh, and everything, uh, methodology one, two, three, no matter, it didn't work. Of course, Georgia should be, uh, as it is the case, more or less, in the European political community, EPC uh, should be uh, in the circle of countries we are negotiating with formally, uh, in the first place, informally. Uh, uh, Ukraine and Moldova are uh, important candidate countries, and. Uh, Morally, also Georgia is a candidate country. And I have to say, because we're in the Wachau, Georgian red wine is as good as white wine from the Wachau. So you, I can just recommend this. And uh, yeah, I, I, I have been to, to the borders to South Ossetia and Abkhazia. And on the other side is Russian influence. And Putin Russian influence means a system where people from Georgia, people from Ukraine don't want to live because they know what it is about. So just for us as a reminder, two brief things which seem to be important to me. The one is, appeasement has never worked. Appeasement has never worked in history. Maybe we can remember that. Also with regard to the Western Balkans, I don't want to go deeper into that today. It doesn't work. Secondly, I don't often quote executive branch people like the Commission's president, but the Commission's president, Ursula von der Leyen, said on March 1st in our special plenary sitting, um, after the beginning of the war in the European Parliament last year, an important thing, and I want to remind all of us on that because it will be important, and it, maybe it already is, that we have to keep our hand reached out to the other Russia. I have to say that because it's for a holistic picture, it will be important because Russia will stay there geographically and will remain our neighbor no matter what. So something will be there after Putin Russia. And we can do and we should do our best to find somebody to talk to and to create relations after all of this. And I'm stating that as somebody who is clear about appeasement and who is clear about defense in an in a unbloody way when it comes to sanctions, in a military way when it comes to the military attack. I also quote Ursula von der Leyen here and you must not forget about this because we, we have one soil and we, we should take care that the next generation will not again face this kind of aggression from the East, because this is what generation after generation has faced. Uh, this must stop now, and we will have to take care for that after this war. Thank you. Alina. I will start, actually, uh, about reaching out to the other Russia, and I want to say that I really admire how Georgia is able to cope with the inflow of Russians who are moving to Georgia since the beginning of the war. It's a huge number of people, and uh, of course it creates a lot of complications and a lot of domestic issues, but Georgia, both the government and the people demonstrated that they can cope, and that's actually something that uh, we in Europe need to look closer at, both in terms of what works, what doesn't, and how some of these approaches can be applicable in Europe before. In terms of the candidacy status, I think there is a general consensus that Georgia belongs in Europe and Georgia needs to be there. But there is also an understanding that uh, certain requirements that are in place are have to, have to be upheld. And there cannot be much space for too much compromise on the compliance with the accession criteria. And that's where Europeans are asking for all the help they can get from Georgians in terms of implementing some of the domestic reforms and moving a little bit faster on this track because 
Um, Europeans are hugely in favor of making sure that Georgia can join, but some of the things need to be done for that to happen. Thank you, Alina. And Elizabeth, I, I really have to ask you to wrap up briefly, please. Okay, so then I won't say anything about Georgia since my two <laughs> colleagues have, have already discussed please, please, Georgia. Thank you. But I will say, since we have been talking a lot about values, um, I think what, what the Ukrainians have demonstrated in this war is that when it, you may be as critical as you like about your country, but if it's, if it's invaded or militarily attacked by another country, you will do whatever you can to, to keep it safe. And uh, I, I wish Russian military intelligence had been a bit better because it, it should have been able to establish before the invasion that Ukrainians would have this will to protect our country and to keep society going. But what we can learn from the Ukrainians is that we need to be able to de demonstrate the same sort of resilience and the same sort of commitment to our countries. And even if, if we are not militarily attacked by anybody, uh, the, the aggression, uh, non-military aggression will continue and we all can uh, play a role in, in helping keep our country safe because what we have in our countries, the, the rule of law, freedom, democracy, freedom of speech, all of that, none of us would want to trade that for anything less than that. So I, I think it's in everybody's interest to be part of, of that resilience, societal resilience, to keep uh, whatever comes our way, to keep it as far as, as possible from our countries. Thank you so much uh, for wrapping up uh, this uh, wonderful round. I think um, our three wonderful panelists deserve a big round of applause from the audience. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, well, I'm, I'm looking forward, yeah, I hope of course that Lucas will continue his work as a parliamentarian for a long time, but I'm looking forward to then uh, your guided tours on the MS Dürnstein um, <laughs> after your career as a politician is over. Thank you very much. May I ask you to take a seat because we are not done yet. Thank you again. And I would like to welcome to the stage our last guest, Ambassador Harald Stranzel. Harald, um, it's great to have you back again at the Danube Salon and uh, we brought you back for, for a reason because um, you're the national coordinator of the EU strategy for the Danube region, EUSDR, in the Federal Ministry for European and International Affairs and Austria will take over the presidency of that very EUSDR as we have heard also on 1st November this year. What are the circumstances, the context for the Austrian EUSDR presidency and what are the main priorities? Thank you, Stefan, for, for having me, for inviting me. And uh, to start with, I could hardly imagine a better place and, uh, and, uh, and a livelier place uh, than this one to talk about uh, the European Union strategy for the Danube region. But you mentioned it already. Yes, in uh, roughly four months, Austria will take over and will start with its presidency. It will go for 14 months till the end of, uh, of the year 2024. So we are going to need a lot of energy. And it's our second term. As, uh, as chair uh, of this, of this uh, platform uh, of the Danube countries. Uh, ten years ago, in 2014, it was our first term. Now uh, it will be uh, soon our next term. And it's really striking how much the world and uh, Europe and also the Danube region have uh, changed since then. In full-fledged transition, the whole region, talking about, and we've heard a lot about uh, geopolitical sh shifts already today. Uh, of course, the problem of climate change, uh, of inflation, the new econ economic environment, of the new working environment, uh, everything this uh, infects our, our lives. Uh, and then also the Russian war of aggression against Ukraine, also a game changer for the Danube region also in particular. And all these calls for intensified cooperation of the Danube countries more than ever before, because the situation now is a completely new one. And, and this is, I think, what we have as an added value of this cooperation platform cross-border cooperation on all these uh, challenges and, and problems uh, of 14 countries, um, nine EU member states, uh, five accession countries accounting for roughly a quarter of the European Union population, so 150 million inhabitants, and making also um, the Danube Basin the most international and also the most diverse, uh, perhaps also most diverse river basin in the world. 
Thank you. Against this background, with, with all the current challenges that we've also heard being discussed um, in the earlier panels, um, the new momentum in the, in the Danube region, I, I understand that these discussions are well underway to develop this ambitious program uh, for the presidency, but uh, what are the main priorities? Can you tell us something about this? Yes, I try to be very succinct and, and short. We've started our preparatory progress process roughly a year ago. There are two line ministries, my ministry, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, and also the Ministry for Regional Development. My colleague, I think, is also in the room today. Uh, the two ministries uh, have prepared a draft program, which is already on the table. It's not yet final, but uh, it's quite likely that we, uh, we have um, the following three thematic priorities uh, high on our agenda. The first one is uh, an issue discussed uh, during uh, this afternoon, so security safety, stability uh, in the Danube region and also a clear European perspective for the uh, Danube countries, for all of them. Uh, of course, uh, clearly uh, going towards uh, our uh, incentive, our contribution to EU enlargement and also to accelerating the accession process uh, for the accession countries, including Ukraine and also Moldova. Uh, and then uh, the second priority uh, will uh, be on innovation, on skills, uh, on uh, business opportunities, uh, including tourism in the Daniel region. This we're going to translate via concrete projects. So for example, there is an innovation, an EOSDR flagship project called Danube Tech Valley Initiative. By the way, because Klopsek was also before on the stage uh, in cooperation with, uh, with Klopsek. And then we have also the idea to organize a high level Daniel region business forum clearly focusing on skills, uh, on the issue of skill skills shortage, uh, demography, uh, and then also since tourism in this uh, region in all the Danube countries is of course very, very important, we are going also to organize an international uh, Danube shipping and tourism conference on sustainable tourism and sustainable cruise on, on Danube River. And the third and, uh, and last thematic priority for our presidency is going to be how can we protect the uh, Danube Basin as an ecosystem uh, and also, of course, uh, protect the natural resources, including uh, water. I think I wouldn't like to go into, into uh, too much of, of details, but we have uh, some EU programs uh, like the Horizon program, Danube for All, which we are going to take advantage of and also use uh, uh, to, to really implement uh, concrete uh, projects and also involving a broad range of stakeholders, also from civil society, by the way. That's a, a really broad and ambitious program. Um, are there any plans, as you mentioned, to particularly involve the civil society and also the youth in the, in the presidency? We hear a lot of the youth already in, in the background. Good, good to know and good to hear, yes, that youth is also here on the ship. And, uh, and uh, yes, uh, of course, Sebastian, uh, uh, just, just as a clear yes and answer, we will um, A, involve, of course, youth, B, civil society at large, and C, also the uh, local and, and the regional uh, stakeholders uh, here in Austria and in the Danube countries. Uh, on youth, uh, uh, there is uh, the recently established Danube Youth Council. I see one of the two Austrian participants sitting in the first row here who actually uh, is a very active and committed uh, member of this Danube Youth Council. We're going to invite the, the Danube Council, uh, the Danube Youth Council uh, to work with us on concrete priorities. And also, I think, which is very, very important, to work and on their vision for the Daniel region 2040. So I think this is very important because uh, the, young, the young ones is next generation Daniel. Uh, and then on, 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 on civil society, there will be the Daniel Participation Day. And we will take advantage also of uh, well-established Austrian initiatives, for example, the EU Councillors Initiative in municipalities and cities, EU Gemeinderäte. We are going also to involve in our uh, presidency program. Harald, uh, last question. Um, Elizabeth mentioned the um, uh, conference on the reconstruction of uh, Ukraine. Besides your role as national coordinator of the ESDR, you've been also recently appointed as the Austrian foreign minister's coordinator for the reconstruction of Ukraine. What is Ukraine's role in the ESDR and will Ukraine also feature on the agenda of the presidency program? And if yes, in what way? Very much will, of course, depend on the further developments uh, on the spot, uh, so to say, and, uh, and we don't know yet uh, when and how this uh, war is going to, to end. But what is clear, uh, Ukraine is uh, a very committed EOSDR member. In 2022, Ukraine uh, was the first non-EU member state uh, to preside over EOSDR. 
really dedicated uh, presidents in spite of the war, which is really um, uh, amazing for all of us. And yes, we are going to, to uh, talk with our Ukrainian friends in Kiev, with the national coordination team there, how we can in a way involve them uh, in our uh, presidency uh, program and planning. So this will be for sure. And I hope that uh, given my double coordinator's role, I can take advantage also of this, uh, of this synergies uh, and with capacity building and with, uh, with really cooperation very concretely on projects uh, uh, expert uh, projects uh, from line ministries in all the Danube countries and Ukrainian countries. I can, I think we can re uh, really make a difference. Thank you very much, uh, Ambassador Stranzel, dear Harald. It sounds like a very exciting period is going to start in November, and I hope that you will also think about, um, especially, of course, the IDM, but also the Danube Practice Conference. As our chairman is not only. Uh, the chairman of the board of IDM, but also currently the president of the Danube Rectors Conference. Harald, thank you very much for wrapping up our Danube Salon 2023. And um, a big round of applause also for the national coordinator. Please. Thank you, Sebastian. Well, uh, since almost everybody had a beverage that does not only contain bubbles, but also alcohol, apart from me. Um, I will be very short on uh, my own uh, benefit and uh, would like to, yeah, nobody brought you something? This is a scandal. Um, yeah, yeah, okay. But, uh, well, I, I will be very brief yeah, for, for both of us. And uh, I would like to conclude this Danube Salon. It, um, over the past couple of years, has been um, very special, each and every decision, uh, edition, uh, also the decision how we implemented it. And uh, there were various reasons for that. We had the pandemic. The Danube Salon two years ago was uh, under uh, pandemic um, conditions. We were very um, uh, secluded, we were very uh, small, but nevertheless we implemented it. Last year, it has been mentioned, the war overshadowed everything. And if we look back to what the topics there have been, we should actually be happy that we are approaching safely the harbor in Krems and nothing worse happened on uh, that ship. I um, don't know if our captain needed a compass for this. I learned today that if you want to know what your security uh, prospects are, go and ask shipping companies, um, because that's what Elizabeth uh, learned uh, us today. Um, but we surely talked a lot about the strategic compass, which was also the title for this uh, Danube Salon. Um, and uh, allow me to continue in this uh, direction and uh, issue three wishes. For the war to end, for Ukraine to be free, and for us to not lose our moral compass on the way. And I brought even one to show it to you. On the path, um, this is what <laughs> um, on, on, on the way, there are a lot um, of people I would like to thank. And uh, the whole team of uh, the Europa Forum Wachau, um, Teresa Edstadler, Max Filipski, who have done a wonderful job for the overall conference, but especially here for that uh, Danube Salon. I think they deserve a big round of applause. Our, our wonderful cooperation partners, the Age Donauländer, Simon Ortner, Teresa Stummer, thank you very much for the years of friendship and cooperation. I'm always very thankful for the crew of the production team in the back who make uh, my micros work and uh, make sure that everything is transmitted properly. Thank you very much for the production crew here. I think we should also give a big round of applause for the ship crew because they brought us safely to Weissenkirchen and back. I think we can still swim back to Krems by now. And uh, I would like to, of course, thank my outstanding guests, the ones who left, but the ones who are all uh, still uh, here. Thank you so much. 
uh, Colin Schikluna, Lukas Mandel, Elizabeth Bro, Alena Kutzko and Harald Stranzler. Thank you very much. And then for me, I mean, it's, it's easy to uh, stand here and read off cards. Um, my job is actually not uh, a very difficult one, but it's enabled by my wonderful team. And uh, it's, they are basically sitting uh, all over uh, the place here. So I would like to thank uh, the IDM team, but especially here, Malvina Talik, who has been coordinating the Danube Salon uh, this year. And uh, they deserve the biggest round of applause, at least from my side. My name is Sebastian Schäfer, I'm the Managing Director of the IDM and the Institute for the Danube Region in Central Europe turns 70 today, not today, this year. I, every year I make a mistake in the last line, but nevertheless, I'll stop here, go get some drinks, the buffet is open, enjoy the rest of the trip. It was a pleasure for me, thank you very much. <laughs>